So Caroline, first of all, set the stage for us. How are the regulations in Europe different than they are in the United States? Well, they've been talking a lot tougher. I mean, even in terms of bang for your buck or bang for your euro, because in Germany, they're even saying, look, we will fine you social media outlets, Facebook included, some 50 million euros if within 24 hours you are not removing the hate speech or indeed the insightful videos that might be pointed towards extremist or, or terrorist-related activities. If you don't pull them down within 24 hours, you could be fined 50 million euros. And indeed, your executives could be fined 5 million euros a pop. So Germany has really led the charge ever since we look back to 2015, really, when the immigration crisis, when people from many a different country, particularly Syria and Afghanistan, came to Germany. And this really incited a lot of hate speech at the time that actually saw people then congregating, going out and struck violence to its heart. This got Germany active. France did the same. We heard from France, the representatives of the social media giants meeting. That was back in 2015 after they had some deadly attacks. And now in the UK, we're hearing the same sort of calls, calling on Twitter, on Facebook to say, be quicker at taking down this sort of insightful hate-related content, we need you to in the wake of the Manchester terror attacks. Now, Keith, Facebook says it reviews 100 million pieces of content every month. Is the scope of this problem just too big for them to deal with? I think to manually review every piece of content absolutely is too big. I mean, there's a billion users per day or whatever there is and, you know, X number of posts, and I think that's unreasonable. Can you use math and algorithms to prioritize um, a very narrow set that need to be reviewed? I think that's a scalable, you know, approach and that can work very well. And I think they understand it very well, how to combine math and machines, uh, math, math and machines with people in an efficient way. And I think they'll be, they're pretty, they actually are better than they get credit for at it and they'll be increasingly better. So you're optimistic about the crack down on hate speech around fake news? No. Um, so I think those are very different things. I think f mm. fake news is actually a fake problem. Mm. And then I think... What do you mean by that? I don't believe there's any evidence that suggests that the average American, let's say, knew less in the last election about politics, policies, political figures than at any time in American history. I think, if, if anything, the evidence is the contrary. People are more informed than ever before. So I don't think, and, and secondarily, I think fake news is an excuse that a lot of people use who used to be gatekeepers to filter views and opinions. And they want to get, insert themselves back into the process of having a role of filtering. And the internet as a whole has eliminated the role of gatekeepers and third parties in terms of filtering, and that's not stoppable. So I think that the fake news is a politically charged politically biased approach um, to constraining a set of opinions. I think hate speech is well defined. In, in the United States, it's generally defined fairly narrowly, and in Europe, much more broadly. I think in the United States, it would be very difficult to get co tech companies to comply with laws passed by parliament or some you know, regulatory regime because we have a very broad protection of the First Amendment that doesn't apply in Europe. And so the definitions of hate speech and incitement to terrorism or violence are much broader and much more wide than would ever be possible here uh, to, to prevent. Caroline, fake news or misinformation or whatever you want to call it was an issue following the Manchester terror attack. Now the UK government is pushing Parliament to pass a law that would require Facebook to basically remove encry encryption on WhatsApp messages belonging to suspects in investigations. Tell us the latest on this. Yeah, this is fascinating and, of course, a bit of deja vu to the San Bernardino attacks in the United States. The same call is here that the United Kingdom Conservative Party, which looks like it could well win by a landslide in the general election come June the 8th, they're calling for potentially the encryption that you have on WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, to the be basically a backdoor created, as was called after the San Bernardino shooting in the U.S., to allow the authorities to access the data of those they believe are related to terrorist incidents. Now, it's interesting how this is all being digested by the United Kingdom at the moment because many feel after the atrocities that occurred on Monday night in Manchester that yes, it would be a good idea if we could ensure that those who have lethal views and might indeed use them can be access their data. Now, I, Rohan Silver, he's a big name in the UK tech community. He helped found Tech City with the previous Prime Minister 
David Cameron, he was one of those saying, look, actually, maybe this isn't a bad idea because in the United Kingdom, what it would be is a judge asking in specific circumstances to access the data of certain individuals. He says, look, maybe that's not a bad idea, tech companies. Maybe you need to step up to the mark here. We're not asking for a blanket backdoor to be allowed, not allowed encryption to be eroded for all of us. But when it's needed by a judge, that could be the case. How should, Keith, the tech companies approach these issues? Should they remove encryption uh, in cases like this? Well, I think it's a little bit more complicated. So first of all, it's always been the case for 300 years that if you go to a judge, you can get a warrant to search your house. Someone's always been able to get a warrant to go through all of your papers, all your belongings, your computers, everything at home. So the idea of applying the same principles to your phone is pretty trivial and not shouldn't be that controversial. The issue in the United States that a lot of people in the tech community have brought, uh, sort of published and broadcast is that once you create a backdoor, it's not clear that the government can constrain it and keep it in the right people's hands and that the wrong people don't all of a sudden have access to everybody's data. And that's like a technical argument. Is it possible to have a secure way to unencrypt things that can only be used by a very small number of people? And historic history sort of suggests maybe not mm -hmm. and math sort of suggests maybe not so there's a danger that people are worried about but the concept of a judge ordering access to data is should be uncontroversial